Test. There we go. All right. It's good to see everybody for our midweek Bible study and the continuation of our summer series. Uh, there was a few folks in here early, and they said that it felt okay in here to them. So if you're hot, you can blame it on those folks that got here early. Um, my suggestion is if it gets warm to you, um, just get up and move to the back because the further back you go, the cooler it is uh, with the doors and the fans and all that. Well, if these people would get up and move to the back, then you could move this thing forward. Oh, then you got problems. All right. We're going to go ahead and uh, get started. We don't want to take any more of Brother Mosier's time. Of course, he's no stranger to us, and Brother Keith is going to be speaking to us tonight on temperance or self-control. He's perfect one to speak on that, isn't he? All right, let's get started with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for this day, for the opportunity to meet together in the middle of the week to study and to pray and to sing and to fellowship and encourage one another. We're thankful especially for thy word that is a lamp to our feet. And Father, we are thankful for Brother Keith and his ability to teach us Pray thy blessings upon him tonight and upon our study. And Father, we ask a special blessing, uh, uh, blessings upon those of our number that are uh, sick and hurting. We know we have uh, some that are recovering uh, in uh, rehab and hospitals. And Father, we have others that are at home, and we pray for them and for those that are ministering to them. And especially now we pray for uh, the Helen Newsom family and their loss and also for Marcia and her loss. And Father, we pray that you forgive us of our sins now and go with us for it's through Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you. Let's invite our attention tonight to the fifth chapter of Galatians verses 22 and 23, where we will find the word temperance. Also, we'll find it in the list of Christian graces, which are to be choreographed in our Christian lives. I said choreographed because the word translated ad in 2 Peter chapter 1 is the word epi choreo, which means to choreograph, to mix together. It's as if you were making a cake and you put all the ingredients in the bowl and you got a cake. Temperance is one of those things that must be mixed in with all of the other Christian graces. This word temperance, I want to do a word study on it first, and that will require some studying of the history of this word. But it comes from a Greek word group, enkrat, which denotes that you have power over someone or something. You have control. The basic sense of this word enkrat is expressed in having power over self, whether that's factual or spiritual. What do we mean factual? Well, in reality, or are we doing it only for a spiritual reason? The Greeks under Socrates began to look at this virtue of a human being as the cardinal virtue. They thought that a man who was independent would be able to control everything in his life from beginning to end or he wasn't much of a man. Plato gave us the definition of the opposite of a person who has self-control. He said it's the one who has no inner strength one who is undisciplined, unrestrained. Anything goes with this fellow. There's no limit to what he would practice, do, say, and so on. He has no self-control. One of our preachers has been saying in recent years that without the direct operation of the Holy Spirit, a Christian cannot have self-control or temperance because it's a fruit of the Spirit. But if the Holy Spirit's doing it for me, it isn't 
self-control. The doctrine is not only not logical, it's not scriptural. We have to have the doctrine that it's a direct operation. We have to have the ability to be temperate in all things. The Essenes, the Jewish ascetic sect, and a host of other people have opted for staying away from society, trying to achieve self-control. I'll just go out in the wilderness and beat myself with something or uh, deprive myself of something, but that's how I'm going to learn self-control. In the second century until now, the Gnostics among us who believe that the flesh is evil think they have to separate themselves from society to practice self-control. If you look at Colossians 3 with me a moment, you'll see the beginnings of this doctrine here in your New Testament at the Colossian church. This is often referred to as the Colossian heresy. It was made up of Phrygian occultism, a little bit of Judaism, a little bit of Greek philosophy, and a whole lot of Greek philosophy, and a little bit of Christianity. In verse 8 of Colossians 3, Paul spoke about being beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, Greek philosophy, that the flesh is evil. I often hear preachers talk about the war between our flesh and our spirit. That's Gnostic doctrine, not Bible doctrine. That's the idea that I have no control. Someone else has to do it for me. But temperance is self-control. Here in verse 20, we're told about the Judaistic uh, ideas of this. Chapter 2, verse 20, that should be not 3. If you be dead with Christ from the ruinous of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not. Those are Jewish ordinances. So they brought these Jewish thoughts in. They brought in the Greek philosophy. They brought in the voluntary worshiping of angels. That's occultism from the Phrygian group that was baptized here in this area. And they had a little bit of Christianity. Jewish literature, the great book of wisdom by Jesus ben Sirach, defined temperance as restraint from sexual and other excesses. He was on the right track, I think. But these errors have led modernists to try to find the, this self-control in an ascetic life. Some have tried to think of John the baptizer as an ascetic. Uh, came out of the wilderness. Well, John was no ascetic. He went out among the people to preach that the Christ was coming. Paul uses the term, let's read it now in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Here he talks about the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then he lists all of the attributes, really, of love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Temperance. Against such there is no need of a law. A man who practices self-control is already a law to himself. And Paul's teaching is that I as a Christian should de refer or deter myself from anything that keeps me from my goal of going to heaven. Look at Philippians 3, for instance. Paul said he didn't as yet have arrived. He said, I haven't arrived. I haven't apprehended. I haven't reached my goal. But one thing I do, I press toward the mark for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul had a way of controlling himself so he could reach his goal. And restraint in this idea of just separating yourself from society or anything that bothers you, that's a foreign concept to Paul. It has to be because the Lord told us to go into the world and preach the gospel. He didn't tell us to abstain from it, to stay away from it. He said to be controlled within it and preach the gospel to those folks. He would never, Paul would never teach that self-control earned salvation. That's what's behind monasteries and that kind of lifestyle. I'll separate myself from society and that way I will earn heaven. That isn't self-control. That is not restraint from anything, really. Look at 1 Corinthians 7, 9 and we'll look at some of the ways this word is translated in other verses. Here, Paul, speaking of those who were not married, said, if they cannot contain, let them marry. It's better to marry than to burn in your lust, is the idea there. And so, practice self-control. If you can't 
practice self-control in this area, then get married. Nothing wrong with being married. Paul used the word temperate in 1 Corinthians 9, 25, when he talked about he that is uh, striving for a crown of some kind is temperate in all things. He's practicing self-control. I remember when we were boxing, we had to practice self-control, especially before matches, so we could win the match, hopefully. We have to learn how to do that as Christians. Something may look like, I, I want to do that. But the Christian says, no, I'm not going to do that. When Paul spoke to Felix, he reasoned about temperance and justice to come. Self-control, the real man, as Paul knew it. And in, the, in 2 Peter, it's used twice, and the American Standard has self-control. So that's the word we're studying tonight. Temperance or enkrat is an old word, Robertson said. means one holding control or holding in. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to think that. Greek Stoics thought they had narrowed down all of the virtues to four. The first one was temperance. And they would let that stand alone as, it, as the best one of all, self control. <laughs> Woost in his word studies, and these are interesting things to study. He has books, a whole book on one word, for instance. Temperance is the idea of possessing power, being strong, having mastery of oneself, being self-controlled, used in 1 Corinthians 7, 9 that we already read, of the control of sexual desire. Paul used the term as an illustration of the control of an athlete over his body and its desires during the time such a one was training. Well, I'm training to go to heaven, aren't you? And the context in which Paul wrote that determines the desire that he has under my, in mind as he writes it. Look at Proverbs 25, 28 with me. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls, no defense. You remember the walls of the ancient cities were their defense. A breach in the walls was weakness. Joshua defeated Jericho, Judges 6, because of the ability to have those walls fall. When my walls fall, I'm defenseless against the world. I haven't kept some things in mind. I haven't been doing some certain things. I've lost self-control. This doesn't have a whole lot to do with anger, folks. That's another subject altogether. This has to do with spirituality. What is it that I have to control so I can be spiritual? We are called to exercise self-control in such a way that we do what we ought to do even though we may not want to do it at the time. You suppose how many tonight said, I'm not going to Wednesday night services? No self-control? We have to discipline ourselves to do what God wants us to do even though there are times we don't want to do what God wants us to do. Paul understood that need. That's why we have 1 Corinthians 9.25. Every man that strives for the win is temperate in all things. He said they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we, an incorruptible. Three important areas to control as we think tonight about self-control. Number one, the flesh. Let's memorize Romans 6.12 before we leave here tonight. Listen to what Paul told the, Corinthians, uh, the uh, Christians of his day. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. That's a command. That means I can do that. I don't need any outside help. That's something I have to do, is control my body. There are a lot of things in this world that would be good to do, I suppose. They might even be permissible. But such cannot be misused to the point that such things control us. Paul said, All things may be expedient, but all things are not lawful. It might be a good thing 
but it may not be the thing to do at the moment if I'm going to maintain my Christianity. Brothers and sisters, we are not allowed to let anything in this life master us. When I was going through my internship with addictive behavior, one of the things I noted over and over again, again with addicts was those things they were doing mastered them. They were not in control. That thing was. Whatever it was. Drugs, alcohol, addictions of any kind. Some have been teaching them that they are uh, disposed that way. They're genetically disposed. to be. No, they chose that lifestyle. They want it, and so they're not in self-control. They don't want to control it. They want to do what they're doing, and so they're doing it. But Paul said, Keith, you can control that. You can stop that. My friend Roger Jackson told me, and Roger at one time was addicted. He now uh, teaches uh, addicts how to uh, overcome. He said the first problem is the thought. The thought, that's number one. You have to fight the thought. If you don't fight the thought, you've lost the battle. We have to learn how to control our flesh. I have to be able to say no and walk away. I thought of Joseph and Potiphar's wife when I said that. What did he do? He said no one walked away, didn't he? We may think we're always under control. But if I have to note that there's a need for it, I may not always be under control. I may just think I am. But there's a need for it or we wouldn't be taught it here in the Scriptures. There's only one way to know if anything is controlling me. Stop it. A young man told me one day in my office that he was addicted to pornography. I said, get rid of your computer. He said, I can't do that. I said, then you don't want to quit. He got rid of his computer. <laughs> he quit. That's how you do it. If, you, if you're not being controlled, stop it. That's the easiest way to know. Society has pushed sex upon us, hasn't it? We have sexual immorality and purity always in our faces, in television uh, uh, shows, movies, internet, billboard ads, magazines. Well, I guess I'll just go join a monastery and get away from all this. No. No, Keith. You just abstain from all filthiness of the flesh. Period. Come under control, Keith. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4. 4 through 7. This is not a new problem. Paul had to tell these brethren that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, his body, in setting apart an honor. Now, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified. For God didn't call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. This Greek word fornication is porneia, pornography. So my friends, if it's not with your spouse, it's sexual immorality and a violation of God's law. Marriage is the only place to fulfill all sexual desires, 1 Corinthians 7, 5. So, Keith, you have to control your desires and limit them to marriage and do so without complaint or excuse. That's the way my God wants it. A spouse may be wrong for not keeping his or her end of the covenant, but his sin or her sin is no reason for me to sin. It's still wrong. I have to practice self-control. That last line I threw in there when I was typing this, I just thought we need to teach our children these things, don't we? before they get married. Look at Romans 12, 1 and 2, the second area we need to control. Brother Whitaker used to say that Paul wrote the first 11 chapters of Romans so he could write Romans 12, 1. <laughs> because in the first 11 chapters we're told about the mercy of the gospel, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, all that I've just written, that you, have, that you present your body as a living offering holy, acceptable one to God, which is your reasonable sacrifice. And be not conformed to this world, but be a transformed. Watch this now. Watch it. Here's one thing we never think about for some reason. By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. The renewing of my what, Paul? 
it was amazing to me about all the things I had to, to uh, reconsider in my mind after I became a Christian. Things I thought were okay to do, they weren't okay to do. Uh, things I thought I could do, they weren't okay to, for things to do. I had to discipline my body, but I also had to discipline my mind and the way I thought. Why? Well, what I think is what I practice. The man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so what I'm going to think is what I practice. The Proverbs writer said, lean not to your own understanding. Don't do that. And Paul or uh, Jesus said that you look at a woman to lust after her. You've lost it in your mind. We have to learn here about preventing evil thoughts. And a good way to do that is not to look at evil things. Look at Philippians 4.8. Brother Ryder preached a whole sermon on this verse. But things to think about. Things to think about. What are they, Paul? Well, he told us to have the mind of Christ. Here's how you do it. Is it a true thing? Think about it. That eliminates the evening news, doesn't it? Nobody said amen there, Robert. I get so tickled at the evening. You know that's the world reporting on itself, and the whole world lies in wickedness. So what are you going to hear? Wickedness. What sort of things are true? When I want to get depressed, I just listen to the evening news. And I go away depressed. What sort of things are true? What sort of things are honest? We buried our friend yesterday. She was an honest lady. Uh, I thought maybe it should read on her tombstone, Here lies Miss Matter of Fact. Uh, she was, and I loved that in her. She was honest. What sort of things are justice, pure, lovely, good news? Got a call the other day. This brother said, Have you heard about so and so? And I said, No, and I don't want to. He said, that's not a good attitude. I said, yes, it is. I don't want to hear it. I don't believe it anyway, especially the one that was telling me. And if there be any virtue, Keith, will the students that are here tonight raise your hands, please? Okay. For the rest of the summer until we start studying logic, do not think about logic. I don't want any of you... You either, John. No thinking about logic. You know what you're going to be thinking about for the rest of the time until we get there? Unless you do what? Replace that thought with something. How many of you have ever had a song go through your head all day long? Ever that happened to you? How do you, how do you fix that? If I think about dieting, I gain 50 pounds. <laughs> because all I'm thinking about is eating. Right? Well, I have to replace that thought with something. I have to change it. Otherwise, I'll be thinking about logic and dieting for the rest of the night, won't I? Okay? I replace the evil thought. Well, how do I do that? I read my Bible for one thing. That'll replace a lot of evil thoughts. I uh, listen to GBN for another thing. A lot of good things on there. It's playing in our kitchen constantly. It's always on. And Dorothy has the affrontery to play my tapes on her computer there, and I have to walk out in the kitchen and hear me. That's the worst part. Okay, I'm sorry. You're having to do that tonight. But when I, if I listen to spiritual music, it helps me. Or Bible lessons. Or just talk to Dorothy. Hear good things. It's very hard for Keith to have bad thoughts when the Bible's kept at the forefront. That should be the area there, not the R. Emotions are perhaps the area we control the least. In my case, that's true. Uh, that's been my biggest fight all of my life. But I have learned not to do this next thing and say what I feel is the reason I'm doing something. It's not what I feel. I just want to say it. I just have the desire to say it, maybe. My feelings are not authoritative. They don't matter. How many have I seen lit, quit some congregation because somebody hurt their feelings and they walked out? The Lord didn't do that to them, but they walked out and I thought, no self-control on their feelings. 
What do my feelings matter in terms of eternity anyway? They don't. And people justify their actions based on their feelings. And I have the right to feel that way, they think. Well, feelings are not authoritative. Look at Philippians 2.14. This is a command, folks. Do all things without murmuring and disputing. Most feelings arise from an improper focus on me. Egocentricity. That's not an, a, a Christian concept. I hope you'll take Proverbs 16.32 home with you tonight. Look at this verse. This is an amazing statement from Solomon. I think it's in the Old Testament. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. Self-control controls even feelings. And so, Keith, I don't want you ever to act on your impulses or your emotions. We don't have to act that way. Even though the world tries to teach it, we don't have to. My emotions get me into the most trouble. I need to control them. Because my feelings aren't always correct. Maybe I have the wrong information. Maybe I didn't communicate the right thing. Christian emotions are grounded in love, that should be, and self-control. Here's the high point of self-control, folks. Thy will be done. That's it. Anything else is self-indulgence. It's His will, none other. He's the Savior of all those that obey Him. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. And so I ask you tonight, are you willing to practice self-control? It takes a commitment to do that. Again, are you in control of that city? Years ago, Brother Wayne Coates called me and asked me about James, the fifth chapter. We were talking about that in the first century, wisdom was a miraculous gift given by the laying on of the apostles' hands. But James said, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberty and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven by the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord, for a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. When I am in the process of controlling my emotions, I have at the same time to learn what the Christian ethic is in this area. I have to learn what is right to do here. That takes great training in the Word of God. And then it takes a lot of prayer. Asking God for this wisdom. I trust that our elders pray for wisdom all the time. It must be a tremendous burden to try to serve over 300 people and all of the different opinions and thoughts and processes that are going on in this congregation. That's tremendous. We need to pray for them constantly. And pray that they too have the wisdom of God. To have a conscience so strongly trained that it will warn me when it's wrong to do it. You remember that the Hebrews writer chastised some people of his day who didn't have their senses exercised to do the, know the difference between good and evil? I was talking to a person one time about dancing. And she said, I don't see anything wrong with it. I said, you're right, you don't. That's your problem. You don't have your conscience trained to know what concupiscence is and lasciviousness. And so she didn't know what those words even were. And so we studied them for a while. And she saw the point. I don't know whether it affected her or not. But my conscience properly trained by the Bible will warn me about these things. And I'll, I'll have that sense of, 
I don't, I don't need to be here. This is wrong. I need to tell you a story about the month after Dorothy and I were converted. We were converted in, the, uh, well, late October, and in December, my mother asked us to go to a Christmas pageant at her church. Not knowing that that was going to affect us adversely, we went. We shouldn't have been there, but we went. <laughs> and it was a Saturday night, not a Sunday. Anyways, as we walked out, Keith, he was about three, he, or maybe two. He, I said, what would you think of that? He said, I'm glad Jesus didn't come while we were in there. <laughs> I said, I am too. <laughs> At the moment, my conscience wasn't trained completely, was it? But it got trained harder and harder, as, or more and more as the years went by. It was warning me, this isn't right, Keith. This is a compromise. You don't need to be doing this. And it takes a lot of prayer to get that kind of wisdom. Temperance has a lot to do with God's will, not mine. The Hebrews writer told us that we needed to learn the will of God. In our country today, 65% of our citizens do not darken the door of any church. In our country today, a politician can ask out loud in public for everyone to mistreat the other, religion, the other political party and get away with it. And you and I are now living in a most impossible situation for Christians. And so this is going to be harder and harder to maintain Self-control. The things we hear, we see, we see people doing, they hurt our, our thoughts and emotions. But let's keep in mind to be surrendering at all times to His will. it would be worth it one of these days to know that's what we did while we were here. Add to your faith and that temperance is to be epikorogeo, mixed in with all those other things. First time I read the Christian graces, I thought, I'll, add to, I'll get my faith done, then I'll add virtue. No, I've got to mix it all at the same time. Choreograph it so that it comes out a beautiful Christian poem. Did you know we're God's poem? Look at Ephesians 2.10. We are God's workmanship. That word is poem. That's what it is. And that person who's in rhyme with God is practicing self-control. Thank you for your kind attention tonight.